So our first presenter is Hannah Costin from the HR division, and she will be sharing with all of us, coaching us on the application process. So Hannah, take it away. Hi, uh, my name is Hannah. I work in the HR division of the Seattle Fire Department, and I manage the entry-level firefighter hiring process. Um, next slide, please. So the Seattle Fire Department is a nationally recognized leader in the fire and emergency services. It's also one of the largest fire departments in the state of Washington with an average response of 900,000 incidents per year. To keep our operations division staffed and to continue to provide service to the Seattle community, the department onboards two recruit classes each year of about 30 recruits. Um, our hiring process is highly competitive and because of public safety standards and the number of applicants who are involved, at times it can be pretty complex. Um, the intent of today's presentation is to familiar familiarize you with the process and to answer any additional questions you may have about it. Next slide. Uh, the Seattle Fire Department cultivates a talented and diverse workforce by offering several employment benefits. Uh, schedule, Seattle firefighters usually work eight 24-hour shifts a month with either two days or four days off between shifts. Um, so this schedule provides a really great work-life balance for our, for our members. Um, advancement opportunities, in addition to promotional opportunities, uh, Seattle firefighters can also apply for a number of specialty and technical teams, including hazardous materials, technical rescue, paramedic, marine unit, and arson investigations. Um, and all of these opportunities come with a premium pay. Uh, starting salary, recruits start at 6800 a month, um, and they receive cre increases at 6, 18, 30, and 42 months, um, and then also receive an annual wage increase as negotiated by the union. Um, and like I said, premium pay for all of these um, specialty teams and other roles that you can take on in addition to um, your regular workload. Medical and retirement, uh, CL firefighters to receive a left two pension, family medical and dental insurance, vacation, comp time, and sick leave. Um, they, all, they may also take advantage of a deferred compensation plan through the city, four weeks of paid parental leave, tuition reimbursements, and paid military leave and employee assistance programs. Um, the department also has a really robust peer support team to support the members' well-being and a critical incident stress management team to lend extra support after traumatic events. Um, that's something that you'll hear a bit more from, from Kristen Cox later on. Next slide. Minimum qualifications. Uh, so in order to be hired as a Seattle Fire Department, um, the candidate must meet the following qualifications. They have to have a high school diploma or GED and a valid driver's license. Um, they have to be able to communicate in English, be 18 years old at least, have a Washington State EMT certification, and meet or exceed the established standards of the hiring process. Um, so candidates may submit an application if they're not already EMT certified, but they do have to be certified in Washington State in order to be considered for final hire. Uh, because of the length of our hiring process, many candidates are able to complete an EMT course prior to their hire date. Uh, the department will periodically offer an in-house EMT course for conditionally offered candidates as well, um, but spots are limited and partic participation is not guaranteed, so many of our candidates prefer to submit an application and then during the process, as they are going through the hiring process, get their own ENT certification so that they're able to just slide right into the available class that we have. Uh, candidates who are not certified in or who are certified in other states will get the rest, will be able to gain reciprocity in Washington State following their conditional offer. Next slide. So after submitting an application during an open application period, um, the candidates receive instructions on how to complete the fire team test and public safety suitability assessment through the National Testing Network. If a candidate passes all portions of the test, they'll be invited to participate in an oral board interview. The results of the assessments and the interview are combined with any applicable veteran scoring criteria and used to rank the candidates on a firefighter register. 
registers are usually used to hire recruit classes for at least two years. Um, and then once the register has expired, a new application period will begin. Um, so because of the length of time between application periods, anyone who's interested in employment with the city, uh, the Seattle Fire Department is highly encouraged to apply during any application period that becomes available, since there won't be another opportunity to do so for several years. Uh, sometimes people will submit an application, but they're not quite ready to join, um, you know, they have military obligations or something like that. It's important to get your name on the register and under consideration, um, just so that you, if so that you'll have the opportunity to join during the two or so years that the register is in use. Uh, next slide. Um, so once the register is established, the process of hiring a new class takes several months. At the beginning of the process, the top 25% of the register will be invited to complete preconditional assessments. The results of these assessments will determine who is invited to participate in an employment interview and be considered for a conditional offer. Selected candidates will need to complete several post-conditional assessments prior to receiving a final offer and being placed in a recruit class. Once a class is hired, CL Fire Department HR will refresh the hiring list, adding names from the existing register to replace anyone who was hired off the list, and then begin the pre-conditional assessment process over again. Hiring processes typically take six months from start to finish, um, and like I said, four classes are usually hired from each register. Um, so overall, the next application period will be opening in fall of 2024. Um, and then the register created from that application process will be published in March. So the first hiring processes from the new register that's established will begin during the summer of 2025. Next slide. Okay, a little bit more about the pre-employment process. Um, so the first step in the hiring process is for the candidate to complete and submit an employment packet. Um, this will include their job history, certifications, resume, and any additional materials that they wish to include. Uh, one of the reasons that we asked for this at this stage is that oftentimes candidates will have gained additional certifications or experience in the time between submitting an application and starting a hiring process. So this is just a chance to make sure we have the most updated information. Um, candidates at this time will be invited to complete a suitability assessment and a candidate physical ability test. The suitability assessment is a series of questionnaires which evaluate the candidate's personal history, personality style, and emotional stability. And the CPAC consists of eight critical physical tasks, which simulate actual firefighter job duties and help determine if the candidates meet the standard of physical fitness required to perform in the fire service. So following these assessments, candidates who pass them will be selected to complete an in-person interview with a panel of Seattle firefighters. This interview will determine whether or not a candidate receives a conditional offer for the next class. Um, in addition to the conditionally offered recruit candidates, uh, the hiring panel will also select several alternate candidates who will be offered a position if one of the recruit candidates withdraws from the process. Following the conditional offers, candidates must complete a medical assessment, a psychological assessment, and a background check before receiving a final offer. They'll also attend a gear fitting at our surfaces warehouse and work with our EMS coordinator to ensure that their EMS certifications meet Washington state requirements. Next slide. Uh, once hired, all candidates must successfully complete our in-house paid recruit training program. In addition to some classroom instruction, the program includes practical training in firefighting techniques and equipment use. Seattle's 15 and a half week program is known as a hands-on and drill intensive program. Recruits are evaluated daily and must successfully complete all elements of the course in order to graduate. Following recruit school, candidates are assigned to an operations division company to complete their probationary year. Upon satisfactory completion of their first year, they receive Firefighter 2 certification and a permanent appointment as a CL firefighter. Next slide. Uh, just a quick overview of the job. Um, the operations division is the largest division of the department spread across five battalions containing 33 fire stations with an on-duty staffing of 211 members per shift. Uh, one of the main responsibilities of a CL fire firefighter is to provide emergency medical services. About 80% of emergency calls are received received by the department are medical in nature. So all firefighters are certified to provide basic life support. 
Um, in addition, our Medic One program is staffed with certified paramedics to provide advanced life support when needed. The Seattle Fire Department maintains an active firefighter prevention pro fire prevention program, including regular building inspections by firefighters with each of the fire station districts. In the case of a fire emergency, firefighters identify the source of the fire, use appropriate su suppression techniques, and search for and rescue victims. The conditions of a fire response include extreme heat, smoke, and working in confined spaces, all where while carrying up to 100 pounds of equipment. Operations members will also respond to hazardous materials incidents and disasters when they occur. When time allows, members will also provide a wide range of community services, including blood pressure screening, fire station tours, and community outreach. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so we recognize that the Seattle Fire Department's process can be um, can seem very complicated, um, but the HR division is always available to answer any questions you may have. Um, one thing that I would encourage everyone on this call to do is to go to our website so they can sign up to receive a notice when the next application period begins and other relevant updates on the hiring and application process. Um, if you go to seattlefirejobs.com and select sign up for updates from the Seattle Fire Department, it'll get put on a mailing list. I am the only person that ever sends anything to that mailing list and all I ever send is the application period is about to open. This is when the application period opens. That's all I That's all I care about. So you won't get a bunch of spam. You won't get a bunch of things you don't want to need. Um, you don't want to read. Uh, you'll just get notification when the application period opens. And it's really important that you get that so that you don't miss your opportunity. Um, our website also has a lot of information on the hiring process and training materials for candidates. Uh, and then questions can be directed by email to sfd.recruitment at seattle.gov. Um, and if you'd like to speak to someone, you can call our headquarters during business hours to be connected with a member of the HR team. Uh, that is the end of my part of the presentation, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. I'll take a look now. And uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Always uh, very comprehensive. And just to echo what she said, the most important thing is that you stay connected with us and that email address and also signing up on our seattlefiresjobs.com. That is crucial to getting the most important news. And also, if you guys are social media uh, friendly, link up with us and you can get up to date information. I like to kind of say, think about it as, you know, when you join a sport, you use the weight room to improve your uh, physical capacity, and then you use the practice field to uh, hone in on your skills, right? So similar approach is what we use with our fire prep program. You know, we're showing you the skills that are used for the career field. Um, with that, I'll touch quickly on some fitness standards. So kind of how I mentioned, uh, physical strength is a, is a big piece of this job. There's a lot of heavy tools. Um, a lot of the work that's going to be done is going to be in gear. So you're going to wear quite a bit amount of weight, um, you know, when you have your full uh, PPE on. To give you some example of how much weight you might be, you know, just wearing just, just alone, the SCBA, the self-containing breathing apparatus, the bottle of air that goes on your back, that's roughly about 14 to 15 pounds. Uh, if you look at uh, your PPE, excuse me, your PPE with the bottle, so your coat, your pants, your boots, uh, your helmet, all that stuff, you're looking at roughly 45 pounds. And we haven't even talked about putting tools in your hand. Um, so with tools, I mean, you can get close to 75 to 100 pounds. So it's a lot of weight that you're going to put on your body before you even start doing some work. A lot of the work that is done, uh, Hannah kind of touched on it. Our drill school is drill intensive. So a lot of the work that you're going to do uh, is pretty demanding. Um, the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA, has one standard for aerobic capacity, and that's for uh, folks to be able to hit 12 mets for their uh, aerobic capacity to meet most of the occupational tasks of the job. Now, a lot of times you might be under that, so some things aren't as physically demanding, right? Just kind of walking to your objective and other things are gonna be much beyond that. Um, to give you some context, uh, METS means metabolic equivalent of tasks. So a 12 MET is kind of similar to doing an eight minute mile run. Not incredibly fast time, not a slow time. So uh, not a, 
not a really uh, re true representation of how demanding some tasks can be. Some things are going to exceed that and be pretty demanding. Um, and on top of that, some of the things you're going to be doing, you're going to be wearing a mask. Uh, you're going to have your bottle pressurized, right? Your mask is pressurized. So uh, with that alone, you lose a little bit of your aerobic capacity just because it's a little harder for you to exhale and inhale um, with your mask on. So when we emphasize that you need to be strong and you need to have a, a physical, uh, a good conditioning background, uh, part of that is because you're going to lose some of that right off the gate when you put your gear on, when you put your mask on, your ass to start to do some of the work. Um, and especially with our drill school being drill intensive, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of physically demanding work day in and day out. Um, and recovery is going to be a big piece of that. Uh, to summarize, maybe some recovery strategies that you can be working on right now, because I do believe they're habits. So it's a good, uh, use, it's good to use the time that you might have now to work on some of these habits. Uh, you definitely want, the big thing with recovery is sleep. So that's gonna be the big piece, all right? So definitely get into uh, shooting for seven, eight hours of sleep, but also um, having a good approach to getting ready for bed, right? So that's that. You know, shutting off the, the, the iPad, the TV, computer screens, all that stuff a couple hours before you're ready to go to bed. Um, maybe practicing some breathing techniques to help stimulate your uh, parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. So what that means is um, trying to get more into like that rest and digest uh, nervous system. And you can do that by doing some box breathing that helps kind of stimulate our vagus nerve helps tell signal our body to calm down and to just relax. Um, the other big pieces are going to come in with recovery is going to be using a foam roller, doing some stretching, and then also having good nutrition habits. Um, so making sure you're getting the right amount of protein, carbs, fats, um, in throughout the day, making sure you're meeting your caloric needs. Uh, a lot of the things that our recruits do and our all firefighters do are not very ergonomic. So having a good base of strength is going to be your best mechanism for just injury prevention overall. Um, a lot of the injuries come from overexertion and overuse. The overexertion piece, kind of like I, I highlighted earlier, you're going to, you're going to do things that are going to be well beyond 12 minutes. They're going to be very physically demanding, um, especially with all your gear on. The overuse piece is going to be, uh, having to do tasks time and time again, and having to do tasks that aren't very ergonomic over and over again. Uh, with that, I'll slowly segue into Kristen's topic, which is gonna be the mental component. Um, a lot of our drill training, a lot of firefighter training is gonna be done sometimes in a high stress environment. So um, if you're not familiar with heights, you know, start figuring out ways you can um, just kind of get comfortable with that, work through some of those things. Um, certain drills like search, for example, are going to be done in smoke or enclosed environments that uh, are, are just pitch black. Like you're not going to be able to see your hands in, your, in front of your face. Um, it's kind of something that's hard to train for, right? But, uh, you know, being in that environment could stimulate a little uh, maybe claustrophobia or just a little bit of like, oh my God, what's going on? So having that capacity to just calm your brain and just like kind of slow everything down a little bit and just trust that, hey, I know what I'm doing. I know that this is a environment that I can trust my skills that I've been training um, to operate in. Um, you know, so those are some things just to kind of keep in mind as you're coming into the career. Uh, John, I'll pass it over to you. All right. Thank you so much. Tons of um, wisdom there and insight. Um, I do like the MET. I learned some things. I, I took notes, so I felt like I was sitting in a classroom. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll get to our next presenter, Kristen Cox. She is our behavioral health coordinator, and we'll hear from her, her role in the department, maybe a little bit of her career pathway, the programs that she oversees, and some of its impact, and maybe an insight or two that she has for you guys. So Kristen, take it away. Great, thanks, John. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, 
it's, it's always nice to be able to share a little bit of information that might help people, even if you choose not to go into a career in the uh, fire service, another first responder job, or even just be supportive of those people who do that kind of work in our community. So thank you for taking the time to, to join us on this webinar. Um, I have been with this department as the behavioral health coordinator and peer support coordinator for about two years. And I come to this um, job with 30 years of experience with the U.S. Coast Guard primarily, but I've also worked with some other agencies, uh, law enforcement, and other first responder organizations as well. Um, my background in that work has been pretty much on the job training, although I do have a uh, master's degree in organizational psychology. So I know that a lot of people probably expect the behavioral health coordinator to have a clinical background working as a counselor. I do not. I am uh, kind of the exception. I am not a social worker. A lot of people who do the kind of work I do have a background in social work. Um, but my background is in organizational psychology. And what that is, for those of you who may not have heard of that before, is applying the principles of psychology to organizational behavior, in particular, helping systems, um, helping create systems that are supportive to not only the mission of the organization, but the people within it so that they're, they're working effectively. And the goal ultimately is to have a uh, collaborative group of people that are striving to meet the mission in ways that are supportive not only to um, each other and the community, but also their own sense of thriving instead of simply surviving along the, along the path of their career. And so things like leadership and change management um, and also organizational trauma um, and healing. Part of my role is to help support the peer support team. The Seattle Fire Department has had um, a very active peer support team for about 20 years or so. Um, and peer support, for those of you who don't um, haven't had any um, familiarity with that, is where we train actual first responders, peer support, um, to be peer support uh, providers to each other. So one of the things that you might be aware of is that this, as Manny um, in basically referenced, this career takes a certain amount of resilience and fortitude uh, because the essential nature of what we ask firefighters to do puts them in constant um, stress, cr both chronic stress and then incident-specific stress. And it's things that a lot of people in their normal lives just don't encounter. And often when we uh, talk to first responders and firefighters who um, are enjoying what they do, but are still feeling the impact of stress, they don't necessarily want to talk to somebody who doesn't get it, who doesn't understand. And that's one of the reasons that we invest in our firefighters by giving them um, a cadre of peers. We have about 50 peers for a department of about a thousand-ish people. And we train our, our firefighters to provide um, psychological first aid to each other so that they have a, a plethora of people that they can reach out to when they're struggling with something, either chronic stress or, or how something about the job has kind of uh, had an, uh, a uh, ripple effect on their life outside the job. And also then when there's a particularly challenging incident that they encounter. And that is something that uh, is a particular piece of what our peers do is called Welcome critical incident stress Maybe management. Um... Uh, critical incident stress management is a way to uh, more formally support people that have just gone through a per particularly um, traumatic incident. And our peers have been doing that, as I said, for about 20 years, and they're fantastic at it. Um, I just help guide and make sure that they're getting what they need to continue to, to provide that support. Um, what we haven't done until recently, and, and I think this is true in most fire departments, is we've only recently really begun focusing on trying to prevent the impacts of stress 
before the incidents even happen, before the crisis point arises in somebody's life, before their coping mechanisms end up worn out or their support network isn't um, getting them everything that they need. And so that's the world of kind of prevention and we're shifting gears to that, uh, which I think I think we're really proud of. One of the things that, um, as Manny mentioned, we encourage people to do if you're even considering uh, a career in the fire service is to really think about what you can do to invest invest in your own mental health now and create that solid, stable platform build your support network, invest in your support network, invest in your stress management skills, uh, because you will need them. The, the, it's not an, an if, it's a definite when. And so um, in order to make sure that uh, you have both the, just like the physical strength and endurance that Manny mentioned, we want you to have the mental strength and endurance as well. And there's specific habits that you can begin to work on. And one is uh, the capacity to stay centered and grounded in a moment of acute stress, the capacity to stay focused and on task, um, even when things around you might be a little bit in chaos, the ability to uh, zoom in and zoom out on a fire ground, for example, or during a drill in recruit school to make sure that you're um, not missing anything, but you're also uh, able to stay on task and, and do the next right thing. And also to communicate in a way that is uh, that helps the team as a whole, the, the company as a whole, the crew as a whole, to really optimize and be effective at what they're doing and, and safe ultimately safe. It translates into better patient care. It translates into more uh, safer operations. It also translates into better mental health down the road. Um, so we are doing uh, resilience training. We're encouraging people to start practicing um, wherever they are now and learn a little bit about uh, resilience strategies so that they can um, have a great kind of platform jumping off point. We are also um, very proud of the fact that we have a number of tools that we can use to connect with people and keep their spirits up. And one of those, uh, if I, is it all right if I share a screen for a moment, John? Please do. Okay. One of those is uh, our a therapy dog team that works with our peer support team. Currently we have three uh, therapy dogs that are working with our peers and we have interviews hopefully in the next couple of weeks for a, an additional few teams as well. This is one of them named Zoe. And it is a wonderful uh, lift to people's spirits to just get visits from the therapy dog team. And we also use them after particularly stressful incidents as well, just to, to let people know that um, even if they don't feel like talking to anyone in particular, there's always somebody that can they can lean on and maybe a little pat on the head would be good. Um, insights, what I would take away from my two years so far uh, doing this job that might be helpful for you is I, you know, not everybody can be a firefighter. I cannot, uh, but it is my honor and privilege to be able to serve people in so that they can serve the community in the way that they do. I also think that it's really important to um, continue to allow to serve the community with compassion one of the ingredients that allows our firefighters to keep doing that day in, day out is to include themselves in that compassion, to take care of themselves the way that um, they would take care of somebody that they cared greatly about. And in order to do that, they have to set up good habits, not just for the physical strength and endurance, but also for the mental strength and endurance. So tap into your resources now. Um, if, if you have uh, any any um, support networks that you can invest in now, one of the things that we know it's really hard to do is wait until you need support to, to start building that support network. It's always much better to have that at your fingertips. Um, I will also say that anybody who's considering a first responder career, 
might be really well served to establish a connection with a counselor or a trusted peer support person well before they start um, even the training for that job. Mental, it's no secret in the last several years that mental health counselors are few and far between, especially ones that understand the what we call cultural competence, understand the fire service. And so trying to find that and get that connection going early on in your career is um, is really kind of a game changer. John, is there anything else you wanted me to cover in particular? I mean, you can keep going. I'm like taking notes, listening, everything, absorbing that I can. Um, I like the part where you um, say invest now. That resonates with, I think, all of us to prepare mm -hmm. in advance. So thank you so much for your words Absolutely. of wisdom. Okay, to our next segment. I call this the blueprint for success. You can call it recipe for success, however you like it. But we have two firefighters who will be sharing with us. And first up is firefighter Emma Howie. And she'll be sharing with us her professional background before joining the Seattle Fire Department. A few things that she loves and likes about this department. And maybe an advice or two that she has for all of you guys. So firefighter Howie, take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, um, John, and thanks everyone for being here. And then I also have a couple slides, um, and I think yeah, they're just getting pulled up here. Um, excellent. Uh, so before joining the Seattle Fire Department, or well, first off, I'll start off. My name is Emma Howie. I am a firefighter on Engine 40, which is based in Wedgwood in Northeast Seattle. Um, before joining the fire department, I had a really wide variety of work. Um, I picked some of the more fun pictures to put on the slide. So I was a seasonal delivery driver for UPS. I did AmeriCorps National Service, which sometimes in those lower pictures was just hauling tools and supplies. And other times on that lower right picture, um, we were gutting homes that had been flooded by hurricanes. Um, and then in the upper right picture, you can also see that I did wildland fire and just absolutely loved that. Um, just a season, so I'm not, not too seasoned on that, but something I really enjoyed. Other jobs, I also worked in the service industry. And so I did, I was a nanny, I walked dogs, I worked at Trader Joe's, I was a server. Um, and then I also volunteered at my local food bank, delivering groceries to neighbors that weren't able to leave their houses. All of these things, uh, they might not immediately apply, to being a firefighter, but they all had that I was working as part of a team. I was active. I wasn't having to sit down all day. Um, and as a person, I am incredibly curious. And so just learning new things all the time um, is something that I really enjoyed and that has continued in the fire service. Um, there's, as people have said before, it takes a lot of different backgrounds to become a firefighter. And we typically work in four person companies. And so my engine company, my driver is, he's an actor, he's a director. He makes sets for his local theater. Um, my officer has worked in home construction and remodel for many years. And then my other tailboard partner is a residential electrician uh, as well, or has trained as that. And so I say that just to emphasize, it takes a lot of different backgrounds to make a good team. And as long as we all have that teamwork, the work ethic, that ability to manage stress and emotions, along with technical understanding of our equipment and the procedures that we follow, and with some physicality thrown in, the ability to get the job done. Um, that really helps. And so, yeah, just further emphasizing what folks have said, takes all sorts of backgrounds to be a firefighter. Um, I'll talk now about why I love my job. Um, I grew up in the city of Seattle and I still live here. My friends and family do as well. And so this is the agency that has responded to my family when we've had medical emergencies. Um, I was taken to the hospital before I was born, my mom was in a medic unit. So it really means a lot to me to get to be serving my own community and um, be one of the people that shows up when people need help. Um, I even, sometimes some of our calls, we have some more mundane calls. Sometimes it's just picking up granny off the floor and tucking her back into bed. And that for me, it means a lot that I get to be the person doing that kind of work and taking care of people like that. I also, we've talked about this already, 
but there are so many different things to learn and so many different paths to go down within the fire department. Um, there's, yeah, driving officers, Hannah talked about it a lot. There's so many different opportunities for me to continue to grow, continue to learn um, and build my skill set. I also, um, as an example, I work on Health One, which is our mobile integrated health team. And so I spend some of my days off, I'll go down and work with other firefighters and case managers. And we drive around the city and support folks that are calling 911 a lot and try to address some of their root needs that aren't being met and that maybe the fire department isn't typically able to meet very well. And so try to actually solve their problems so that they don't need to be so reliant on 911. Um, and then finally, I love making dinner with my crew. And uh, I love the team environment that I get to work in and uh, getting to share that with other folks. And then my next slide is gonna cover, yeah, some of my advice. Um, something that I think is helpful to know um, is that this is, this is a huge process. There is a lot of change involved in it and there certainly was for me. Um, when I was in a, your position, um, whether just learning about the fire service or starting to, uh, or continuing to do applications, I was really interested in being a firefighter and I really wanted to try, but I wasn't very confident that it would actually happen. And there wasn't this like grand feeling of, I'm gonna do this thing, it's gonna be great. Um, it was more just that I continued to grow and continued to chip away at um, just getting better piece by piece at things that I needed to improve on. Um, so personally, I had to learn a lot about strength, a lot about nutrition. I ended up, I gained about 25 pounds to prepare for drill school and I needed all of that. And I mean, that's a huge shift that takes a lot of time to do. And so sometimes I think the scale of these changes is, is hard to understand um, when, we're, when we're talking about it. Um, I also had to learn, this is something that's come up, how to downregulate my nervous system, how to calm down in these really high stakes um, tests and on emergency scenes. Um, I still, when I'm on my way to a fire, I'm always practicing my, my long exhales um, and really trying to make sure that my body is alert, but also calm enough to take it all in and uh, be able to process all the information around me so I can do my job as well as possible. Um, so something that the growth mindset has really helped me, that even if I'm making a mistake, even as I fail, that's giving me important information on how I can improve and um, what I can do better next time. I, let's see, I would, yeah, emphasize the focusing on fitness early, getting those resources, the community, getting that sort of thing. It takes so much, it takes a community to become a firefighter. Um, and what really helps if you've been nurturing that along the way, or if you've had a strong one already, um, takes all those supports. And then one last thing is that I know everyone is really busy. Uh, folks have, you've got crazy jobs, crazy work schedules, kids, all of that. Um, but I would really encourage just taking this all a piece at a time and not biting off more than one can chew and ending up burnt out. It's kind of like what Kristen said, setting oneself up for success over the long run, um, finding ways to incorporate preparation into ways you might not imagine, like wearing a weight vest while you're washing the dishes or cleaning your house. Um, if you've got young kids, that's, they're the awkward loads that this job involves um, and kind of asymmetrical. You're already doing a lot of that. So finding the places that you're already prepared, you're already preparing and, um, and building off of that. And then I have, these pictures are just me doing the firefighter stair climb. And then um, I'm a little bit small for a firefighter, so I fit in great in the gear locker. Um, so thank you all so much for being here and, and looking forward to talking more in the breakout rooms. Thank you, Firefighter Howie. Uh, thank you so much for your transparency, uh, just your ability to connect with all of us. I see, I'm sure all of us see ourselves in you and we can appreciate that transferable skills. That's my love language. So thank you for highlighting that. Okay. Our next firefighter is Firefighter Adele Botha. 
She will also be sharing with us her professional background before joining the SFT, a few things that she loves and likes about the department, and maybe an advice or two that she has for all of us. So Firefighter Botha, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. Just uh, got, yeah, there we go. Uh, I was like, what did I do before the fire department? I need the slide. So um, I have a, a degree in civil engineering and uh, with that degree started working for a, a really large uh, civil um, construction company um, in the Seattle area. Uh, I did, I worked as a concrete uh, superintendent building bridges and giant infrastructure, worked on town transit. Um, all of that stuff was super cool, super interesting. Um, and I really loved it, but it was really stressful and one day I was like, oh, man, I like really feel like I want to be doing something that means more in the world. Like I want to do something where I feel like I'm having impact, not just adding more concrete and making a lot of money for my boss's 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 boss. Um, the company that I worked for uh, didn't like do a great job of caring about their employees and I just got kind of burnt out from it and then started to think about what else I wanted to do with my life. So I became a river guide. Um, I worked as a swim coach. I was a bartender. I worked as a lifeguard. I just did all kinds of different things and started my own construction company at the same time. So I was just kind of all over the place. And then um, I took a, a water rescue, uh, open water uh, swimmer water rescue class, which a friend of mine had turned me on to. And uh, I had no idea when I signed up for it that it was actually just for firefighters. So I took this class and uh, all of these, I was the only woman and the only civilian in the class. Um, and these guys were amazing and I had such a great time. And at the end of the week, they were like, uh, you would be a great firefighter, you should do it. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll look into that. Uh, and so I started doing some research and realized that it was actually firefighting would, would be a great culmination of all of my skills it, with my construction background, um, even being a river guide, like knowing how to talk to people, knowing how to guide people through stressful situations, uh, leading, uh, being on a team. Uh, and I like started to get really excited about it. Um, I used to also play rugby and the thing that I love about rugby is there's a position for everybody. There's a position for like the small fast people and the really big, giant, strong, heavy people that are kind of slow. And I feel like the fire department is the same way. There is like a, a role or something special, something fun for everyone to do. Um, so like Emma said, uh, we in the fire department and the Seattle fire department come from a massive range of backgrounds, education, childhoods, uh, locations, uh, you know, all over the states. Um, I, I'm from South Africa, so we have a couple of international folks, uh, lots of different backgrounds, lots of different life experiences, and it, it makes for a really fun work environment. I'll take that next slide. Um, so I've been in the department for six years. Uh, I work at Station 22 that's down in East Lake. Um, the, uh, also, like Emma said, there's so many opportunities in the department for doing fun and different things. And I have really enjoyed exploring a bunch of those. Um, I'm on our peer support team that uh, Kristen talked about earlier. Uh, I'm a rescue swimmer for the department and an instructor for our rescue swim team which is an extremely rewarding and uh, fun program that gets you to go places that you never thought you would be swimming. Um, I, uh, I have three kids and I've realized now that I only put pictures of two of them in here. So I feel bad, but the little one's a baby, so she won't know. Um, I came into the de department a little bit later. Uh, I was 37 when I joined uh, my, uh, youngest at the time was six months old. So recruit school was brutal. And I really needed my community support to help me through that. And um, it was it was wonderful. Uh, and it was a wonderful experience. I did joke 
a lot of times with the, some of the guys in my recruit school, they were like 22 and their moms made them all their dinners and lunches and they're, they're like six foot two. And I was like, oh, you know, and like obviously didn't have any kids. And it's like, you guys are having a really different experience in recruit school than I am. Um, but it was totally doable and it was fun. Um, I think a lot of people talk about recruit school as the most fun they never want to have again. Um, I, I think like for me and, and part of my advice is like mental strength was such a huge part of surviving that you're, you're just like getting so tired every day, being just grinding, working hard, exhausted. Uh, it could be a super hot day where you're just exhausted and dehydrated. It could be a really cold day where you're in wet bunker gear all day and your feet are wet all day. And it's just, it's really it really mentally is exhausting. So if you're super physically fit, which I highly recommend you get as fit as you possibly can be and, and as strong as you can be. Um, if you don't have that mental toughness, uh, that it's going to be hard. And that mental toughness is something that you'll need working in the department too. The, the great thing about the day to day in the fire department is some days you have like a totally chill day, you know, you just go on runs, there's like nothing crazy happens, you're just like, uh, you know, picking old people up, or maybe bandaging up a, a, a small wound or, you know, responding to a car accident where no one was injured, and then other days just like, totally destroy you, you have tough runs, big fires, um uh really difficult uh runs and and you know being prepared to see see things happen in in your city that um you're not used to seeing like seeing the the tragedy and the trauma that happens that we that we're there to help for is is tough and so that mental toughness really goes a long way um, I had no idea what firefighting was when I decided to become a firefighter. Um, so I just recommend you talk to as many people as you can. Um, I, uh, am happy to be available to people to ask any questions. It is a, a super different experience than any job you've ever had. You have dinner with your coworkers, you spend 24 hours with them. They become more like family, um, uh, than uh than anything else and it it's just a bizarre and super fun experience um i would say it's go with the flow you know sometimes uh in the application process you can get frustrated because it takes a long time just keep training uh keep keep working hard and and be ready for it to happen very quickly at the end uh like hannah shared i think the you know the fastest process is about a year but if you're not in that first class, it can easily be a year and a half to two to two and a half years before you from the day you apply to the day you start recruit school. So just um, understand that um, and just go with it. Uh, the end is a the end of that that long process is a very, very uh, fun and rewarding career. And then find things that make you happy, like in the in the department and outside. Like I love the water. So the rescue swimmer program is amazing for me. Um, I, but have like interests outside the department. It's important to keep, keep hobbies, keep grounded. Don't let firefighting become your whole entire world. Um, and then like Emma also said, your friends and, and your community um, will support you. Um, they'll support you through your whole career. Um, and you'll need them. You'll need breaks from your coworkers. Uh, you'll need breaks from thinking about the department. You'll need all of that stuff. So uh, keeping that strong community, keeping those friendships, the partnerships, um, and, and paying attention to them and not uh, getting too sucked into being a firefighter. Um, I, uh, I just had to add this one story. Uh, Emma was talking about... Um, you know, using your day-to-day -day life and your kid, kids, if you have them, to train. When I was training, I 
uh, had a six month old and I was watching another or another friend's six month old as well. So I would do stairs with one of the babies on my back in a backpack and the other one in my front and like a baby carrier uh, in Carhartt's in a sweatshirt, like going up and down the stairs. And people just looked at me like I was a complete psycho, but uh, it was <laughs> it was awesome and a really good training experience. Uh, and I'd say that with your training too, like be uncomfortable. Don't train in shorts and a t-shirt because you're never going to be in shorts and a t-shirt. So, um, but I, I appreciate everyone's time and I look forward to chatting with more of you uh, towards the end. Thank you. Thank you, Firefighter Botha. I'm going to start running up and down the stairs with my three-year-old uh, today with the, that thing on. So thank you for that. And, and also just that, again, that transparency, and really connecting with us. I think you spoke to our hearts um, and I'm sure people took notes there. Okay, so thanks again. Yeah. Okay, our next segment, uh, we have a special guest. He is the fire chief, Harold Scoggins of the Seattle Fire Department. And you guys will get a chance to meet him here as we do a quick Q&A session uh, if Chief Scoggins is available. Hey there, Chief. Nice to see you. Hey, John, how you doing? Uh, doing well. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, looks like a great uh, group of folks that have joined, and I'm sure they want to get to know you. But I thought a good way to, to really have a dialogue between you and I is to just kind of go through some of the questions. I came up with a few, uh, if that's OK, if I may ask a few questions. Sure, but before you ask, I want to lead with a big thank you. Um, to Hannah for taking the time to cover the process. You know, it's really important. A lot of people get lost in the processes and places they don't understand. And Hannah has offered her services to send her a communication if you have follow-up questions. That's really important. Also, a thank you to Manny. Manny is doing prescriptions to help people get their body right so they can um, be successful in recruit training. But, but bigger than that, to be successful in life. That's important. And then to Kristen, you know, the mental wellness and Kristen's mentioned that um, she's been with us for a couple of years and we're seeing, I believe, significant change in the organization, you know, on the, on the mindset front and how we're growing, you know, and firefighter Howie and firefighter both, thank you for sharing your experiences. Oftentimes people think um, most firefighters come from a lineage of firefighters. And what you heard today is that that's not the case. You know, you, you got to have grit. You got to have want to. You can't replace work ethic. You can't replace not giving up. And you heard some of that. And that's really important. And thank you to John for um, being our, our radio late night voice MC and, and managing us through this process. We appreciate that, John. So now you can leave with the questions. How about that? All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, question one. Please share with us how you got into the fire service. You don't have to tell us when, but how you got in and your journey leading up to becoming the fire chief. Sure. Well, I'll tell you when. Uh, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, I graduated high school in 1983, and I'm from, I'm from L.A. I graduated from Hollywood High. And I was going to West LA College and I quickly realized that um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I was taking classes. I thought I was doing all the right things, but I really had no path. I was probably having a lot more fun with my friends away from the community college than I was in college. So I went and took the military entrance exam, the ASVAB test. And I didn't tell my dad I, I took the test, um, but depending on how you score, they give you a list of jobs and occupations that you can do in the Air Force. And they gave me, you know, about three pages of jobs. And that's when I asked my dad for his advice. I said, hey, you know, I went and took the military entrance exam. I'm going to go in the Air Force, but I don't know what to pick. And his advice was simple as my, my, my dad was pretty straightforward. He said, well, hey, why don't you pick something you may want to do in case you don't want to make the military a career? And the list shrunk way down real fast and firefighter jumped off the page. So that's where I got my start in 1984 in the United States Air Force. I enlisted for four years. I was a firefighter. Basic training then 
was at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. It's since moved. And the Air Force Recruit Academy after basic training was at Chanute Air Force Base in Illinois, ran tool Illinois in the summer. Um, yeah, so it was interesting, but it was the best experience of my life. It helped ground me, it helped build a foundation. I learned what the profession was all about. And, you know, I often will say, I was wandering in the room without any real direction, but when I learned that I wanted to be a firefighter, it's like someone flipped the light on in the room and the path became so clear for me. So that's when I started oh, 40 years ago, April. So mm -hmm. in a few days, 40 years ago, next month, April 17th is when I went in the Air Force. Wow. Yeah, that's quite the uh, quite the career. And maybe touch on, I know you were the fire chief in Glendale, California, as well as Seattle. So... Sure. Very illustrious career there. Sure. So when I got out of the military in 19, uh, in April of 1989, I tested for four fire departments in the Southern California area. And my goal was whoever hired me first, that's where I was going. And I tested for um, um, LA City Fire, Glendale Fire, Pasadena Fire, and Pomona Fire. Ramona has since been absorbed into the Los Angeles County Fire Department. And I scored really well in, in all the processes. Glendale's Academy started November 1st, 1989. And I said, that's where I'm going. In, in the middle of that, I was still in the middle of LA City's process. And, and you know, their recruiters would call me and say, hey, you coming? Because it started December 1st. But once I started that training academy and Glendale's in 16 weeks, I said, you know, I don't think I want to do this again. And so at each day went by, um, you know, my roots grew a little bit different, a little bit deeper. But I spent 26 years down in Glendale, and I, I rose through the ranks in Glendale, uh, firefighter, engineer, uh, captain, battalion chief, deputy chief, and I became the fire chief in 2008. I was a fire chief from 2008 to 2015 in Glendale. But once again, it, it's when that light comes on in the room, um, I I knew I wanted to do something and I knew I wanted to create a path, but I didn't know how, but a lot of things became easier when you knew what the end goal was for yourself. You know, I went back to school. Um, I got my associate's degree from Glendale community college. I went to Cal state Los Angeles and got my bachelor's degree in fire administration. And then I went to um, Cal state Long Beach where I received my master's degree in public administration you know, all while working full time, I had an admin assignment when I was working on my master's degree. So I would literally drive from Glendale, if any of you know the LA area, from Glendale at four o'clock in the afternoon down to Long Beach um, for my night classes. I was taken for my master's degree. I did that for two years. Um, but it was it was really good because actually I got to use what I was learning in real time. So as these, I was taking these master's level classes, I would I was doing those jobs, so I got to apply it directly. So that was really good for me. It's really healthy. Very, very helpful. That traffic that just brought a little bit of trauma to my to my heart, but uh, you did it. You got it done. Second question. This is an important question. Even I'm sure it is for you, but for everybody in the room, what are the core values of the Seattle Fire Department, and how can a firefighter incorporate those values into their work? Sure. Um, you know, that that's a really important question because, you know, the community believes in trust in their fire department. And it's and that's really important for me um, as a chief of the Seattle Fire Department. You saw the core values on Hannah's slides, I believe. They were at the bottom of the slides. But it should be who you are um, as an individual, not just the days you're on shift, but it should be who you are you should have the highest level of integrity. That is so critical. The community lets us in their house, not just at two o'clock in the afternoon, but two o'clock in the morning in the worst state that they have probably ever been in sometimes. And not only do they trust us to let us in, oftentimes they trust us to lock the doors, cut the lights out, change the smoke detectors, empty the trash, all while they're gone to the hospital in the back of an ambulance. So oftentimes we're the last one there. So your integrity is so critical, and it's really the starting point for so many things. 
And then you think about team. Teamwork is one of our values. Everything that we do is together. And, and I think you heard our firefighter say that. We work in groups. You know, it's rare you see a firefighter alone on our on our aid cars, medic units, our engines, our ladders. We're with groups of people. You have to be able to work with others. I think Firefighter Howie gave you the rundown of her crew and all those varied backgrounds. But when they come together as a team, you can make anything happen. So you have to believe in team. It's not about you. It's not about the best idea. It's about working together as a team. And then compassion. You know, we go on some very, very difficult responses. And sometimes it could, after over a period of time, you could become pessimistic, pessimistic. You could become judgmental. You're responding to a homeless person in the tent. You're responding to someone who overdosed. All these very, very difficult calls. But we ask our folks to have compassion for every call we got that we go on, not just the the easy ones where you go into the big house and everything seems right and, and things just aren't going right. Those are the easy ones to have compassion for. More difficult ones to have compassion for are the really, really hard ones. You've gone on this person and they've overdosed before. You've gone into that encampment before and this person isn't changing their life. You pick the worst scenario. That's where your compassion really needs to ring true. That's important. And then courage. You know, courage should be a part of who we are. And oftentimes people believe that courage is climbing in that window and doing a rescue. And that is courage. And we're going to be giving some more awards out for courage on April the 18th for people who did exactly that. But that's not the only scenario where courage is displayed. Courage is also displayed in having a voice when someone may not have a voice, not being afraid to speak up or do something different or go first or take a chance. All those are different scenarios where you can have courage. You know, moral courage is a term that I think about a lot because sometimes in the most difficult scenarios that are not fire related, we need our folks to have moral courage, whether it's inside of our stations or out in community. And that becomes very very important. And our last value is diversity. We serve a very diverse community, not just people who look, look different, but there are different classes of people. They think different. They do different things. They walk different walks of life. You think about the diversity, and, and um, sometimes people think about it in a singular, linear mm -hmm. fashion related to race and ethnicity, and, and, and it makes it simple to think about diversity that way. And, and and you can see it, and it's pretty easy to see that. But there's so many other aspects of diversity. You know, um, folks may not make a lot of money. I was just having a conversation with some people earlier this week. And, um, you know, we have a great starting salary here in the Seattle Fire Department. And um, our flyers, I believe they say $94,000 a year. And I was having a conversation with some community members. And I said, that's really good. But to live in Seattle and to be able to buy a house in Seattle... You know, a study just came out and said you need to make about $214,000 a year. Even though $94,000 is a is a good salary, but that starts to create a class system of, of who can live where. We often hear about wages, and minimum wage in Seattle is a pretty high one, but it's hard to survive in Seattle on those wages. We all have different occupations. We all think differently. Some of you come from rural environments. Some of you come from urban environments. So... Diversity, you know, resonates in so many ways, and that's the way we have to be thinking about it. All of our folks, all of our firefighters, you know, we sum all this up, and you you can see the the little uh, here to serve under the logo on on my slide there. You know, our goal is to serve community. You know, our mission statement is to serve community, to save lives and protect property and the environment, and do it in a professional way. And I often sum all that up with just those few little words. We're here to serve. You finish the sentence. It could be on a medical call. It could be a fire call. It can be a rescue. It could be someone just needs help back in bed. It could be someone needs a tent. Uh, Firefighter Howie mentioned she works on Health One. And uh, Firefighter Bolton mentioned she's a rescue swimmer. 
And we got those rescues and watercraft coming soon. So that's going to be a good addition to that program. Um, but here to serve that as long as we have that that mindset that we're here to serve community, we're generally going to be OK. That was a long answer, John. I'm sorry about that. No, I'm, I'm still listening. It's resonating a lot. Uh, third question is, um, the two firefighters touched on this. What recommendations do you have for individuals who do not come from the traditional fire service background? Oh, you mean like me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> Your all story. Right, well, yeah. I'll start there, but first I'll do a few plugs. Um, so on May 11th, the King County Fire Chiefs were going to be hosting a diversity and recruitment workshop. And this time Puget Sound Fire is holding, hosting it down in Kent. David probably has a flyer he can drop in the chat, but it helps you get prepared. You know, it's all about preparation. You know, it's all about cutting the light on in the room. It's all about understanding. Oftentimes when we do things for the first time, we'll look, we're a little unsure. We get, we get asked that question for the first time. We kind of stumble through it because we don't really know. We may put the gear on for the first time and it may be a little clunky. We may walk into the building for the first time and we may feel a little nervous and all those things are true. But but what helps with that? It's preparation. You can put the work in right now. You can go to workshops. You can connect with programs that are around you, whether they're auxiliary cadets or explorers. You can stop by, by fire stations. You can get a mentor. Oh, you, you, you should start working out too. Um, you know, when, when people ask me about that, I, I, I give some simple advice. And um, one is buy a sauna suit. And buy a good one, because if you don't buy a good one, you're going to rip it. But buy a good sauna suit. And I'm not telling you to go and run marathons in it, but I'm telling you, when you get your weight vest and you start walking in it and get one of those um, elevation masks, you can start to simulate encapsulating your body which is what your gear does to you and put the weight on your shoulders like an SCBA and walk on the treadmill for 10 minutes, then 12 minutes, then 20 minutes. You can start to do squats. You can start to do a series of exercises so you can start to get yourself physically fit. But one of the other things you need to do is you need to get used to eating a healthy diet. I, I think I heard it was mentioned that someone gained 25 pounds. Absolutely. I don't know if any of you have ever been in an environment where you're burning four to five thousand dollars, four to five thousand calories a day for 15 weeks. If you don't come in prepared for burning four to five thousand calories a day for 15 weeks, imagine the strength you're getting ready to lose on a daily basis. That will start to immediately affect your performance. Your mind will start spinning out of control. You will start to feel lightheaded. So you have to adjust the diet. You have to do, build your strength. You have to get physically prepared. So all of those things, you know, should be happening. You know, another program we offer here in King County, we just had it on March 16th, and we'll be doing another one in the fall, is an interview prep session. And so we had about 100 folks sign up to do interview prep sessions, and they got immediately, they got a critique right after. Oftentimes, you come to an interview, and we don't tell you how you did. You just walk out the room, and it's a puzzle. So we set, we set up that in a learning environment. And then we have um, our King County Fire Chiefs who set up Women in EMS and Fire. That one's getting ready to happen on April 20th and 21st, but that one's booked, but you should look out for the fall one. So programs like that will help you prepare, but you have to connect with an organization. You have to connect with someone who's going to be a mentor someone who's going to give you the honest talk about what it needs, what you need to do to be successful. Thank you. Thank you for all those recommendations. Um, and I think our firefighters are willing to share their contact if, if folks are interested for the ongoing conversation. Last but not least question. Um, I sat on this and I put myself in the applicant's shoe and I was one long time ago. Why should someone apply for the Seattle Fire Department from the chief? Oh, well, my answer is pretty simple. Well, this, this is the best career you can have. You know, I, I think I just mentioned, I, I'm about 40 years into it next month. Never thought about doing anything else. Um, you know, the feeling that you get when you help someone who's really in need is unlike 
any other feeling you can have. You can do a variety of different jobs. And every call is not like that. Uh, you know, the, you know, every call is not like that. But you will have those calls where you genuinely have had an impact on someone's life. And it could be from a fire call. It could be from an EMS. It could be from, from, from helping someone who needs help back in bed. It, it could be something as simple as that. There's not many other careers that you can have that feeling. And it, it's, almost, um, it's almost not fair because you get a good feeling from it for doing something good for someone else. You know, so, but this career is not for everyone, you know, and so you got to be real about that. You know, you're going to see some stuff here. Here's the most recent call. Um, and I, I, I know this just happened, um, about a week ago and my time may, may be a little bit off, Well, we had an 11 year old kid who overdosed. You got to be able to put your personal feelings aside and help that 11 year old kid who overdosed and figure out what that 11 year old kid needs to get help. We just had a suicide yesterday. Um, teenager jumped off a bridge. Go in and help. You know, last year we had um, 131 vacant building fires in the city and we had three fatalities in three separate vacant building fires. Someone had to go in and do the search and find those people. We have some pretty significant vehicle extrications. You gotta, you gotta be able to understand one what your job is and then after that call is over call Kristen and her team to say hey you know what I need to talk a little bit about what I just saw um, so this job's not for everyone but for the people who it is for I gotta tell you most if not all love it and wouldn't do anything different you know um, I, I was having a conversation this week about people transitioning in and out of different careers I, every time I sit in these meetings with different community members, I'm so happy to, well, we, we don't have that problem in the fire department. Most folks stay 25, 30, 35 years. We got someone at 50 years right now on the job. People don't leave. People love what they do. That's important. You have to love what you do. Cause if you do, you're going to do it with passion. You're going to keep your, your, your ears open and your eyes wide open and your mind open to learn. You're going to continue to want to grow. You're going to continue to want to support those who are working around you. And all those things are important. Wow. That's what I got, John. Thank you so much. Uh, that makes me want to apply this October. Um, very passion, mission driven. Um, thank you for spending the past like, 20 minutes with us. We appreciate your time. Absolutely. And if you ever have questions for me, feel free to reach out. But I will be there on May 11th, so we can talk in person, too. And I can answer those questions. All right. Thanks, John. I'm take off. All right. Thanks, Chief. All right, everybody. On to our final segment. Um, we are at 526. The time's a little bit uh, tight. How about we just break out for the next 10, 15 minutes? Um, and David will split us into two groups, one firefighter and an HR person uh, in one room, and another firefighter and HR member in the other room. So David, send us to our rooms. And you guys can ask any questions and just engage with them. All right, I'm opening up the rooms. They should be rejoining now. Okay. I hope you guys had a brief, I'm sorry, it, it had to be cut a little bit short. Um, we wanted to finish the entire thing by 5.30, but somehow we made it through 5.37. So let's just close out our webinar together. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that that was informative. It was engaging. You felt that sense of connection with us. And I don't want it to stop here. I want you guys to continue the conversation with us. Email us. The PowerPoint will be dropped in the chat. And this was also recorded. So you can review all of this on our YouTube channel and connect us, connect with us on our social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and the likes. And let's keep the conversation going. And the, the major plug here is that in October, the application window is opening. That is very crucial for all of you guys that are looking into the Seattle Fire Department. So thank you for spending time with us. And uh, I hope you guys take care. Talk to you soon.